Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. The Great Sphinx of Egypt is one of the largest man-made sculptures in the world, measuring 240 feet long and 66 feet in height, and cut from the natural limestone bedrock. It has the body of a lion and the head of a human, wearing the royal dynastic Egyptian headdress. In the 1950s, alternative Egyptologist and mystic René Adolphe Schwaller de Lubitz was the first to speculate that the body of the Sphinx had been eroded by water. Inspired by Schwaller's ideas, in 1979, John Anthony West was the next to attribute the Sphinx erosion to water, claiming the statue could be the handiwork of a lost ancient civilization. Around 10 years later, West sought the opinion of geologist Robert Schock, who validated the claims from a scientific perspective, stating the Sphinx enclosure shows clear evidence of rain erosion, and therefore the Sphinx must have been created when Egypt was far wetter, which he believes was sometime around 12,000 years ago, and that's according to his website. In 1993, John Anthony West and Robert Schock featured in a documentary titled The Mystery of the Sphinx and narrated by Charlton Heston. And this documentary brought what was once a fringe theory to the masses. And since then, because of the credentials of Robert Schock, I would say that most people now accept the Sphinx is older than 10,000 years. Some people, a lot of people, now believe it's a proven fact. In the 1998 Channel 4 documentary series titled Quest for the Lost Civilization, Graham Hancock showed how the Sphinx looked out towards the constellation of Leo on the spring equinox around 12,500 years ago, further evidence the Sphinx was a truly ancient monument. All of these ideas from West, Shock, Hancock and also Robert Beauval are what captured my imagination as a child. At a similar time, Rudolf Gantenbrink had discovered the unopened door in the Queen's Chamber southern shaft in the Great Pyramid. And, I have to say, the 1990s really was an exciting time to be interested in ancient Egypt. Most people do not look beyond the work of Robert Schock, and that's because he is a professional geologist. It's case closed and so many people don't even know there is strong opposition against the Sphinx rain erosion hypothesis. And not just from Egyptologists, which is to be expected, and not just from one rogue geologist trying to make a name for himself, but from many independent geologists. These geologists are not associated with the Egyptian authorities, or even each other, but are professionally educated and employed in geological sciences, and they have all taken an interest in the origins of the Sphinx. These geologists have visited and studied the monument in great detail, but they don't get the airtime like Western Shock got in the 1990s and beyond. Joe Rogan is yet to invite Colin Reader or Rob Schneiker onto his podcast. There is no Charlton Heston narrated documentary about limestone salt exfoliation and groundwater wicking as ways to explain the erosional patterns. And that's because it's not as exciting. It doesn't fill the mind with wonder and intrigue. When I started the Ancient Architects channel, I believe that Robert Shock was correct without question. I didn't read around the subject or look at the opinions of those that disagreed, I accepted Shock's credentials in geology, and therefore I accepted his hypothesis. But as someone with a background in geology, with the more research I did, the more I started to notice holes in the Sphinx rain erosion hypothesis. And so in the past few years I did start to dig a little deeper. I found the work of Dr James Harrell, the work of geologist Colin Reader, analysis by geologist Jorn Christensen, papers by K. Laugori, and now the recent presentations and website of geologist Robert Schneiker. None of these geologists share Robert Schock's opinion on the age of the Sphinx weathering, 
and most strongly disagree with the analysis. Colin Reader does agree that surface runoff water from rain was certainly involved, but believes it dates the enclosure walls to some time in the early dynastic period. Trying to find an independent geologist who has studied the Sphinx, who actually agrees with Robert Schock, has been an impossible task. And so, for me, this did set off alarm bells. Schock does hold his own in debates, he presents his case, but there are other ways to explain the erosional features that are seen on the Sphinx and Sphinx enclosure, as featured in the Mystery of the Sphinx documentary. If you want to learn more, check out David Miano's video on the World of Antiquity channel called Age of the Sphinx Battle of the Geologists, where he sums up some of the key arguments very well. The thing is, physical observations in the field can have various interpretations, so it's difficult to really get any clarity. But with regards to the Age of the Great Sphinx, I think there is one piece of compelling evidence that is really hard to argue with, and that's what I'm presenting in this video. Geologist Robert Schneiker is the first person I've seen present this, but a new scientific study released just a few days ago backs it up. This evidence is the reason why I gave this video a somewhat definitive title why the Sphinx can't be older than 3500 BC. Because, at present, I can't see a way around it or a way to refute it. I'm yet to see any response from Robert Schock as well. A brand new scientific study was published on August 29th, 2022, titled Nile Waterscapes Facilitated the Construction of the Giza Pyramids During the Third Millennium BCE. And although it isn't the subject of the paper, the data presented in the study, combined with the previous work of Robert Schneiker, shows that the likelihood of the Great Sphinx being a monument any time before 3500 BC is very unlikely. So, let's see what this new study says. Well, around 4,500 years ago, during the 4th dynasty of Old Kingdom Egypt, the Pyramids of Giza and the Great Sphinx overlooked a now defunct arm of the Nile River, a natural fluvial channel recently named the Khufu Branch, which allowed stone to be transported from the quarries via the river and dropped off right up close on the eastern edge of the Giza Plateau. During the Old Kingdom, people did work this branch of the river. They cut through the western levee, they dredged basins down to the depth of the river in order to harness the annual 7 metre rise of the flood, like a hydraulic lift, bringing the higher water levels to the base of the Giza Plateau, creating deep channels that could be navigated by boat. On this man-made waterfront, directly connected to and influenced by the behaviour of the Khufu branch of the river, the Egyptians built the Khafre and Menkore Valley Temples, the Sphinx Temple and also harbours. The study shows that the Khufu branch of the river, today totally dried up, did have a relatively high water level during the 4th dynasty of the Old Kingdom, but its height was only around 40% of its Holocene maximum, and that is a very important point to remember. This diagram shows the extent of the Khufu branch of the Nile, and again, at just 40% of what it was. The scientists behind the study used pollen-derived vegetation patterns to reconstruct 8,000 years of fluvial variations on the Giza floodplain, this region marked here. The study allows us to understand the changing behaviour of the Nile River, the specific Khufu branch and not just in dynastic history, but also the final 3,000 years of the African humid period, when we know that northern Africa was far wetter. During the African humid period, the Sahara was covered by grasses, trees and lakes, and wet monsoon activity in tropical Africa directly affected the Nile flow, the height of the Nile River and the extent of the seasonal floods. As stated, during the Old Kingdom, we now know the height of the Khufu branch of the Nile River, which came right up to Giza during the annual Nile Flood, and this was only 40% of its Holocene maximum, 
Yes, during the African humid period, the Nile was much wider and also much higher. The flow rate of the river was also significantly more and that's because all of the wadis were active. All those dried up channels we see in the desert landscape. Another large river called the Wadi Hawar, also known as the Yellow Nile, also flowed into the main Nile. Because of all this extra activity, because northern Africa was far wetter, in the African humid period, the Nile was fierce, strong and devastating. It cut the deep canyon that the Nile is flowing in, which is one and a quarter miles deep at Cairo, and today filled with sediment. According to geologist Robert Schneiker, if the Sphinx already existed before dynastic history, the soft limestone of the monument would have been inundated by the Nile for at least part of the year every year for thousands of years. During the Holocene Maximum and other peaks in activity, it could have even stood inside the Nile all year round, feeling the full erosive forces of one of the world's largest rivers and, at this time, one of the most powerful. Although there have been many man-made changes to the Giza Plateau, we do know the elevations of the bedrock. The pyramids are generally at an elevation of around 60 to 80 metres above sea level, with the Sphinx located at around 20 metres. In the Old Kingdom, floods did not reach the 20 metre elevation of the Sphinx, and because we know the elevation of the harbour that was created in front of the Sphinx Temple, it's safe to assume that during the Old Kingdom, floods reached about 15 metres in height. But as stated in the new paper released at the end of August, in the Old Kingdom, the Khufu branch of the Nile is characterised by a level at around 40% of that reach during the African humid period. And so the Nile River and hence the floods were once a lot higher. Using floodmap.net, here's what happens when you raise the Nile to just 25 metres. The Sphinx is almost completely engulfed. Here's what happens at 30 metres. Here's 35. So, if the Nile floods rose by just 10 metres compared to the Old Kingdom, the Sphinx would be inundated. The African humid period began around 14,500 years ago, and it ended around 5,500 years ago. Taking out the dry periods, and it means there were around seven to 8,000 years of a high-flowing Nile River with large seasonal floods in this period. The poor quality of the Sphinx limestone, especially the soft member two, as analyzed in great detail by Robert Schneiker, means the monument would not have been able to withstand the strength and power of the river and its floods for thousands and thousands of years. This limestone is so soft it can crumble in your fingers. The Sphinx is located on the Nile floodplain, and during the African humid period, according to Robert Schneiker, if the monument did exist, the river would have destroyed the Sphinx. There would have been no head poking up above the plateau, no defining features that make it look like any kind of animal, and by the beginning of dynastic history, it would have looked more like this. It seems that so much time is spent analysing the erosion on the Sphinx enclosure walls, but no time is spent analysing the Nile River itself, which should be the very first thing we do, considering the location of the Sphinx on the Nile floodplain. The new study that was released a few days ago has identified the Khufu branch of the Nile River and has now mapped its relative height over the past 8,000 years. If the Sphinx existed in the African humid period, if it was created around 10,500 BC as some suggest, according to the work of geologist Robert Schneiker, it simply could not have survived. We all know the terrible devastation by floodwaters in the modern world. We've all seen the pictures on TV, even recently in Pakistan. Well, on the Joe Rogan podcast in 2017, 
Randall Carlson details one such devastating Nile flood that happened around 10,500 BC, a time when the Nile would have been far higher than in the Old Kingdom, and if it existed, the Sphinx would have been well within its boundaries, especially during flood events. According to the paper Late Quaternary History of the Nile by Adamson et al., this particular truly devastating flood event didn't last for just one or two years, it lasted for centuries. Although a few details are outdated, Schneiker pretty much agrees with Carlson's assessment of the ferocity of the flood. Here's a clip from the podcast with Carlson explaining the devastation. When overflow from Lake Victoria and higher rainfall in Ethiopia sent extraordinary floods down the main Nile. And those floods have been documented to have been 120 feet above the modern floodplain of the Nile. Any civilization, or whatever you want to call it, living along the Nile River at that time would have had to abandon whatever they were doing there in the in this regime this intensified hydraulic regime and it says so if the sphinx looked out at leo in 10500 bc it could well have been hit by many centuries of devastating and cataclysmic floods these are the kinds of deposits from such floods the types of boulders that would have been transported with the nile and could have smashed into the edge of the giza plateau and also the sphinx itself year after year, every year, if it existed. When these floods eventually calmed down, what would have been left of any monument that was made of soft limestone would still have been inundated for part of the year, sometimes all year round, every year until around 3500 BC, which roughly marks the end of the African humid period. By the time of dynastic history, the ancient Egyptians would have found an amorphous, headless lump of limestone. And that's because of thousands of thousands of years of flood water erosion. And, as Colson points out, some of the events would have been truly enormous and devastating. In my opinion, in trying to understand the origins of the Sphinx, the knowledge of the Nile River should be the starting point before we even begin to try and understand what caused the erosional pattern on the bedrock. But with every hypothesis and every scientific study, we should also list possible problems for fairness. Firstly, Robert Schock could point to his seismic refraction data as evidence for the Sphinx enclosure being cut around 12,000 years ago. He says it shows a distinct weathering profile, and from that we can estimate when the enclosure was cut. But talking to other geologists, and Schock's interpretation of the data is just one possible way to read it. Geophysical investigations are prospecting tools, and no conclusions can be reached until intrusive methods are undertaken. Colin Reader does offer a different interpretation of the data, as does Jorn Christensen, and it's regarding the nature of the sedimentary layering below. Low and high velocity zones in sediments are not just related to weathering, but also the rock type. We really can't argue, because we haven't seen what's below. So because there is no geological consensus on how to read the data, and because it can be used for and against an older sphinx, I haven't considered it for this video. But you could argue the floods were not as devastating as we are led to believe. Maybe floodwaters were absorbed by swampland, or diverted by highly fractured bedrock, or some other natural feature we haven't considered or have no evidence of. These are all ifs and maybes, but it's fair to raise them because we can't see back in time. Computer modelling would be a good idea. The problem with all of this though, is that based on the new study, at various times in history, the floodwaters were likely too high at Giza to be naturally diverted away from the Sphinx. If it wasn't for the Aswan Dam, the Sphinx and Sphinx Temple could well be flooded again today and the flood levels today would be far lower than the African humid period.
The Nihilometer, situated on the Nile to the northeast of the Sphinx, shows that on several occasions since 1430 AD, the Sphinx enclosure was inundated by Nile floodwaters, with floods reaching a maximum height of 21.4 metres, making the Sphinx an island surrounded by 1.4 metres of water, and that was only 600 years ago. Although we can see a relative height through time, I would like to see specific quantitative values for the height of the Nile River and its floods at the Khufu branch throughout and after the African humid period, or at least good estimates, and maybe that will help us to understand it all a bit better. So, based on the new study, Schneiker's work and Adamson's account of the Nile floods in history, when looking at the origins of the Sphinx, the first question we should ask is, can the Sphinx have been made before or during the African humid period? The answer is very unlikely, because of the height of the Nile River and also the ferocity of the floods. Also using common sense, it's also arguably the worst place to build a giant statue anywhere at Giza. Surely, to be safe, people would have built it on much higher ground. The next question is, OK, when could the Sphinx have been made? The answer is after the African humid period, sometime after 3500 BC. The next question, can the behaviour of the Nile River narrow this down any further? Well, technically, the Sphinx could have been built earlier in dynastic history, or maybe even in very late pre-dynastic history, but if everyone is in full agreement that the Sphinx Temple was built from blocks that were quarried from the Sphinx enclosure, as geological studies have confirmed, then we need to find the specific time when the Nile floods first fell below 16.8 metres, which is the elevation of the Sphinx Temple. If the floods were higher than this, no temple could be built. With that in mind, based on the new diagrams of the Nile level at Giza, as published in August 2022, we can assume that the Sphinx Temple has to have been built sometime around the mid 3rd millennium BC, because the Nile looks to have been far higher in the early dynastic period. This also aligns with surface luminescence dating that took place at the Sphinx Temple, which gave back a date of the 3rd millennium BC. So how do we explain the erosion? Well, this can be explained by numerous factors. A combination of groundwater wicking, salt exfoliation, rainwater runoff from the Giza Plateau, wind erosion and so on. Multiple processes that already affected well-weathered bedrock. The Sphinx and its enclosure do not show one type of erosion. We also need to remember that it still rained, sometimes quite a lot in the Old and Middle Kingdoms and Giza flash floods were not uncommon, even destroying the Menkore Valley Temple, possibly in the 5th dynasty, because we know it was rebuilt in the 6th. As previously stated, I'm yet to find another geologist other than Robert Schock that believes the Great Sphinx dates back to 12,000 years ago. I've spoken to Schneiker, Christensen and Reader. I've read Harrell and Gowry, and even though they all disagree on various things, they do all agree the Sphinx was built after 3500 BC. I would love for Shock to watch Robert Schneiker's lecture from a few years ago, as well as his interview on the World of Antiquity channel from May this year, both of which are linked below, and I would love to see a rebuttal, to see how he counters Schneiker's claims. On that so it's it's got to be after the African humid period so it's got to be younger than about 5,500 years because if it were around prior to that it would have been eroded away completely by the Nile River there, there'd be nothing left of the Sphinx if it were older than 5,500 years 5,000 years somewhere in that neighborhood. Schneiker's work combined with knowledge of historic devastating floods as published in Nature and quoted by Colson, 
together with the August 2022 study on the Khufu branch of the Nile, makes it hard to understand how anyone can now think the Sphinx really is a truly ancient monument, if indeed the monument was flooded in the African humid period. If someone can counter it, fantastic. I would love to hear it. But until then, scientifically speaking, I can't see how the Sphinx can be any older than 3500 BC. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.